Welcome all to the Arcadia University College of Global Studies Edinburgh Centre um, to our series of talks that we're, that we're running uh, each semester. I'm delighted today to be able to introduce uh, Ken McLeod, who is um, uh, originally hails from the Isle of Lewis, a uh, small Hebridean island off, off the west, west coast of Scotland. He then went to study at the University of Glasgow um, and uh, then went on uh, to work in um, software as an mm -hmm. engineer and then uh, became a writer. That's currently uh, 15 novels, is that right? I think so, yeah. Around about 15 <laughs> novels, uh, multiple uh, award, uh, awards that he's won uh, in, in the field of science fiction. Uh, so I've got a couple of quotes that are quite nice. Um, his novels are a complex exploration of future politics and revolutions and bring fresh life and wit to the utopian form. And uh, a quote from Ken, you'll hear a lot more from Ken himself, is uh, he likes to look at things and imagine their consequences. Mm. So uh, that's a good one to ask So Ken, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank you much, Hamish. And thank you all for coming along. I'm, I'm going to talk very informally about really where I come from, how I became a writer, how I write, and how this, this novel, The Restoration Game, is seen here in its nice American paperback edition, and in its nice British paperback edition, slight difference in cover styles and so on. Very typical, in fact, is a difference between American and British publishing. American covers tend to be particularly if speculated fiction covers tend to be a lot more um, illustrative, if you like, and specific than British ones, which tend to go for being evocative. And we've learned that evocative covers don't work so well in America, so there you go. <laughs> uh, as Hamish said, I was born in the Isle of Lewis, on the Isle of Lewis, as, as we put it, in 1954, and I left when I was about 10, around about 1965, when my father, who was a minister of religion, a minister of a small Scottish church called the Free Presbyterian Church, got a call to the Greenock congregation. And I grew up in a situation of rather odd, um, a rather odd alienation in that everyone around me spoke Gaelic as a, as a first language, but our family didn't, despite the fact that our parents spoke Gaelic as a and in fact, my father preached in Gaelic on Sunday nights. And when, when we moved to Greenock, I had five brothers and sisters and another one on the way. And it was a great, a great exciting culture shock walking down the streets and because I was used to ambling along in the, on very basic roads, literally bumping into lampposts with I was such a such a, a country cousin, and I, I found it you know, very exciting. It was a very industrial town, severe air pollution and all that, and but really it, it felt like a, a, a boom town at the time. And everybody, when they left school, could walk into a job, or if they were too too smart or too ambitious to walk into a job, they could more or less walk into university. You didn't need to take out a loan, you got a grant from the government to do it, and so on. We didn't know how lucky we were. And um, when, when I was a teenager, I got kind of, when I was a kid, in fact, I, I read an awful lot. Uh, like many people who become writers, I was a tr tremendous reader as a child. I read voraciously, I read everything regardless of the age or sex of the supposed reader or, or of the characters. You know, I read adult books, I read non-fiction, I read, um, read our sisters, you know, comics, read my, the girls' books in my mum's grand, grandmother's house. I read the boys' books in my cousins' houses and so on. Read, read an enormous amount. And at the age of about 12 or so, I encountered a science fiction novel and really never looked back. And it had the somewhat unfortunate effect on me that it convinced me that I wanted to be a scientist. And I spent the next nearly 10 years trying to be a scientist and 
eventually failing dismally. And right in the 1980s, like many failed scientists at the time, I was looking through, doing a clerical job and looking through the back pages of New Scientist, the British Science Weekly, which has job advertisements at the back, and found an advertisement for uh, retraining as a computer programmer. And I passed the aptitude test, to my great surprise, and retrained as a computer programmer. And I found that at that time in London, the IT industry was basically full of people like me, in that there were a remarkable number of people who had science degrees and no science jobs, and a remarkable number of people who read science fiction. And round about the time, when in the late 80s, when I finished my postgraduate degree years too late and, they got my, and finished my thesis, I thought, well, I've paid my debt to society. I've put something in the library that maybe nobody will ever look at again. But I've, basically, I've written a book with a print run of 12. <laughs> but I know I can write a book. And more or less coincidentally, around about that time, my, my late great friend Ian Banks, who I'd known since high school, had launched his third or fourth novel. And at the launch party, which I think it came up to Edinburgh to, from London to attend, at a launch party or a flat where the party continued afterwards, I heard from a mutual friend that Ian was getting heartily sick of hearing from me about all the novels I was going to write. So I thought I'd I thought this was, this was my chance. I was going to prove to him that I could write a novel and prove to myself that I could write a novel. So I started writing my first novel, The Star Fraction. And that went through several drafts, one of which I sent to Ian's agent, a lady called Nick Cheatham, who is still my agent. And she told me that she liked the language and liked the the characters and so on, but she couldn't make head or tail of the plot, and I couldn't understand what the problem was. And she said to me, if it was a film, what would you have on a poster? And I said, it's a story about a man who gets killed, but his gun goes on fighting. She said, great, now go and write that book. So I spent that summer rewriting it, and that was the, the draft that got accepted. And I got a two-book contract, then I got a second two-book contract. And oh, I was still work working as a computer programmer back in Edinburgh. In fact, not 100 metres from here, I was working in the Management Information Services at Edinburgh University. <laughs> and writing a novel in 18 months while doing a full-time job is uh, quite hard work. So I think by the time my second two-book contract came along, I made the reckless decision to <coughs> excuse me the the reckless decision to go full time as a writer, which I've often had occasion to regret, <laughs> because unlike being in a a well-paid and a fairly secure job like a programmer, you you can get good money, but it's it very uneven. However, I've been gone on, and as Samish said, I've written 15 or I think by now, 16 novels since then. The, la the latest, my latest novel is currently with the um, proof, uh, going, going to proof. It's been, been through the copy edit process. And it's a third in a trilogy. My first four novels, The Star Fraction, The Stone Canal, The Cassini Division, and The Sky Road, are all set in roughly the same fairly near future, but extending into different far futures. And when I'd done them, I, I wanted to write something that would potentially be a money-spinning series, rather like my friend Ian Banks's culture novels, or was my master Blue Joel's Vorkosik and Saga. That is, you, you'd set up a a universe which is essentially an adventure playground for your characters, and you can then repeat the repeat. You have different adventures in book after book. So uh, that became 
the engines of light books. And when I, when I, when I, was, when I, was, when I was writing the third one, I realized that I could no longer really believe in the uh, bizarre universe I'd created. And I'd better wrap this up and call it a trilogy and pretend that's what had been my intention all along. <laughs> and it was after that, by this time I'd been writing for about 10 years, full, almost full time, and I, I thought, I wrote a couple of um, space operas, and then I thought it was about time to come back to Earth, because it was in 2003, 2004, and I had 10 years worth of um, fury at the way the world was going, so I went back to near future fiction. The, my, My first novel, in the return to the near future, as it were, was called The Execution Channel, about the war on terror. The second one, The Night Sessions, was a police procedural set in Edinburgh and involving religious terrorism by Presbyterian terrorists. <laughs> a long delayed revenge, that. <laughs> <laughs> and the third was The Restoration Game. And how the Restoration Game came about, how this novel came about, was that my wife and I spent our, for our 25th, I think it was, wedding anniversary, we went to New Zealand to visit my far-flung brothers and sisters and to explore that amazing country. You, 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 there are certain landscapes in New Zealand where you go through and you say, wow, this is like something out of the Lord of the Rings. And then you remember, yes, it is actually out of the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> You've seen these actual mountains in the actual movie. Um, the, the, the character, Lucy, who mentions uh, later on in this book, she mentions a mountain range called the Remarkables. And she says that the name is as if the European, the first Europeans to see them had staggered down from the Cook mountain range with nothing, nothing left but this and their barrel of adjectives. <laughs> um, but how it came about was that, or how it started was my wife and I were waiting at the airport of a little town called Queenstown, a little resort high in, high in the mountains and waiting for a plane, and we were sitting outside looking at the Remarkables, and we heard on the PA system an announcement saying, will the passenger Lucy Stone please report to the airport information desk? And my wife said, that sounds like the start of a novel. I wrote it down, <laughs> and it became the start of a novel. It's not quite the start, because the start, it, there's a, a, a an earlier start from um, a different and wider world that wraps around the world of the novel. And this, in this novel, The Restoration Game, it, it, I've had the idea for quite some time, and I discussed it with my editor, of writing a near future quasi-contemporary techno thriller in which a computer game a multiplayer computer game was used as a safe environment to carry out uh, some kind of plot, to plot a revolution or an, an uprising or whatever. And my editor, my then editor Darren Nash, was very enthusiastic with that about that, and said so it sounded like a good idea. And I started thinking and researching and so on. And. I'm not quite sure, to be honest, where the character Lucy came from, or where the, the um, except that she came, of course, from the PA announcement. Yes, I started wondering who is this Lucy Stone, and why is, why does she have to go to the, go to the airport information desk, and what's going on, and it kind of evolved from there. And in the course of writing it. I drew on various experiences that I'd had and adventures that I'd been on, and places where I've uh, been, such as the you know the places in New Zealand, 
including a Queenstown itself. The most, some, in fact, some of the most improbable sounding things in this book are more or less true, but I'm not going to tell you which they are. Um, I, I was myself in the 1970s on a journey to Eastern Europe, which is kind of like the, what is called the Five Cities Journeys in, in the novel. And I discovered later that these journeys were part of a much vaster conspiracy than the one I thought I was in um, when, I, when I sat down. When I happened to be watching, back in 1999 or so, watching a, a BBC programme called The Spying Game, in which the very same um, operation that I was in was finally revealed as a CIA plot. <laughs> um, I nearly jumped out, of, jumped out of off the sofa, because I was in that van. Yes. So I, in, in, in the story, I, I disguised it slightly by having it in a lorry rather than a van and drawing in this character called Cairds, who's based on various, I suppose based on various friends of mine. The, the party where, where Lucy's mother meets um, Ross, the, um, the main, I suppose he was the main male character in the book, um, is based on a party that I was at in Glasgow around about that time in the late 70s, and um, where, where I, I met Carol. But I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> that was the other funny thing. I was telling Carol about that party. Carol and I were, were talking about that party just a few years ago. And we re each realised that the person we'd been so interested in at the party was each other. And we, we, hadn't, we hadn't known. And that, that, but it was even after I had written this, this novel. It, and Carol had read the novel and she still hadn't quite. So one can draw on real life, one can draw on real experiences, even when one is writing science fiction. Where I get the rest of my ideas from tends to be from reading New Scientist, or at least skimming it every week, reading books on philosophy or politics or biography or whatever, history, this kind of thing. If you ever want to be a writer, um, I think you have to enjoy the genre which you're writing in and believe in it. There's no point in writing, well, you, you really can't, certainly for popular genre fiction, you can't get away with writing um, in a genre that you despise. Or, you know, this is a, a thing that sometimes does happen, where people will pick up a few books in a genre and flick through it. Say, this is rubbish, I could do this. I usually find that they can't because you think the genre is rubbish and you're probably not fit to write it. Um, yeah, read, read a lot, and I don't anymore read enough science fiction, which is actually a, a great um, embarrassment to me and one that I hope to could write in the not too distant future, but I'm way behind on contemporary science fiction. And you need to read the works of your peers and your um, colleagues. You need to keep up with the how the techniques are developing in the field and how the how the argument is moving on. Because science fiction is a a genre which exists in multiple dialogues. There's a dialogue with the world, with the new developments in science, with changes in society, with speculations and philosophy. And there's also the dialogue within science fiction itself. So that, to take a, a fairly simple example, H.G. Wells was, I mean, was probably the first writer to come up with the idea of a time machine. But other people had speculations or, in fact, variations on time travel existed in a fantastic or mythical format for centuries, if not millennia. But Wells was, as far as I know, the first to come up with the idea of time travel as a technological possibility, albeit a fantastical one. And as soon as you have the idea of time travel, you have the possibility of all those paradoxes which 
Wells either didn't think of or deftly avoided, hoping that his readers wouldn't think of before somebody else did. Like, what happens if you use the time machine to travel back into your own past and, as the cliche goes, kill your grandfather or whatever? And what, ha what happens if you write, if you travel into the future, write a dictionary of the language of the future, and then take it back and give it to your earlier self, who is going into the future? So that they'll be ready to speak the language when they get to the future. Etc. And in the course of the 20th century, particularly I think in the first half of the century, by which time it was almost completely played out, science fiction writers rang all the changes on all the different possibilities of time travel. And similarly with ideas of space travel, which began ostensibly um, scientific with Bear, although Bern, evidently, despite his great pride in getting the technical details right, really had not worked out what would happen to your body if you were shot out of a gigantic cannon at the moon. <laughs> um, he famously said about Wells, H.G. Wells had the idea of, got his traveller to the moon by plating the bottom of their spacecraft with an anti-gravity substance called Kevarite. And Wells, Vern, sorry, Vern, more or less said, where is this Kevarite, Mr. Wells? You show me it. Um, whereas I, I have a pipe gun. <laughs> <laughs> um, but w Wells' um, Im imaginary journey to the moon has its own delights and um, its own interesting scientific speculations as well. It's only that they're not really about the the, the method of travel used. Uh, but, as time went on, science fiction writers became more sophisticated. They worked out the orbits, sometimes with pencil and paper. Nowadays, you can just, you just do it on your computer. It's very easy to be very lazy. And began looking at, um, trying to build base things on the um, best scientific information at the time. And as we know, the best scientific information at the time can become obsolete. When I was a wee lad, it was still considered a serious possibility that Mars had canals. I remember a popular astronomy book from my childhood which said quite confidently that you could, over the course of a year on Mars, one could see the advance and retreat of the vegetation. It was taken for granted at least there were some low, lowly forms of life on Mars, and now we know that that is not the case. It was thought that Venus, because it was cla a cla cl had a cloud cover, was under a cloud of water, and you know it was a hot, jungly planet, or possibly an ocean planet. And it's now no longer possible to write stories, except ironic ones, retro ones like in a recent anthology called Old Venus, you, you can't write um, straight science fiction set on that imaginary Venus, but it doesn't stop me having the occasional pang when I look up and see the evening star burning through the Edinburgh fog, wishing it, was, it had its jungles and its swamps and its gigantic sea, sea beasts. Uh, I'm just to wrap up, as it were, I'll say that, as you can tell from my, so far I think, 25 minute rant, I'm still tremendously enthusiastic about, about science fiction, and I intend to go on writing it um, while I physically and mentally can, which I hope is for a long time. I would write a mainstream novel if I could come up with any good ideas for a mainstream novel, but I haven't. I, I'll just close with an anecdote about Ian Banks. I once, once bowled to him about my um, powerless financial state, and he said, write a mainstream novel. And a few months later, I said to him, well, 
that was good advice, but whenever I get an idea for a mainstream novel, it turns into a science fiction novel. To which he replied, well, don't. But so far, I, I haven't been able to do that. I did, however, write a science fiction novel, which is kind of a homage to an Ian Banks novel, and that's Descent. It's about two young pals who are growing up in a not-too-distant future Greenup and get knocked down by a strange light from the sky, which um, changes their lives ever since. Um, after writing these sort of all these near future novels, I came up with um, an idea right out of the deep, dark past of science fiction, which is essentially about a robot revolt in space from the robot's point of view. And my editors were so enthusiastic about that that they gave me a, a contract to write a trilogy, a trilogy in two years. Uh, yet another decision which I live to regret. <laughs> but the third, the third volume is indeed coming out in September. Touch. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Um, at the beginning, you mentioned that you read a book when you were 12, a science fiction book, and never looked back. What was that book? It was Rocket to Limbo by Alan E. Nursh. Mm -hmm. Nursh was a very fine writer, of a very competent writer of science fiction. He also wrote a mainstream novel. He was, in fact, a physician. He wrote a mainstream novel called The Practice, which was about a, what, what it says on the, on the tin. Um, and, but he, he mainly wrote very well-considered uh, science fiction novels, some of which were for young readers. And I think the one, that first one that I read was written for younger readers. And it introduced me to all the crackpot ideas of the Golden Age SF. Because right at the start of the novel, there's a marvelous scene where somebody is at a spaceport and they're seeing fishermen from the planets of Vega with their gold dangling earrings going up the ramp and cattle herders from all Deberan and robots from somewhere else and they're all going you know like one of those scenes of star star wars or something like that a variegated scene and they're going off on this they're all going off on this faster than light starship faster than light travel but before faster than light travel there was the multi-generation ship that is a, a ship traveling at a tiny fraction of the speed of light one that we could technically technologically build now if we were crazy enough to put all our efforts into doing it, going off to Alpha Centauri, and this ship disappeared. Nobody has ever heard of it, and it's, there's, the novel is about finding the lost colony of these people who, who um, were on that first ship. And it's very romantic. It's full of things like psychic powers and telepathy and telekinesis. Again, which seemed to me at that time serious scientific possibilities, um, which again some psychologists even then thought they were. Um, there was a chapter on telepathy in one of the one of the psychology books that I read it as a student. <laughs> like it's, I think it's Sense and Nonsense in Psychology by Hans Eysenck, and, and it was in the in the sense part, not the nonsense part. The reason was that, as I think it was either Isenck or Arthur Kustler, who funded the Kustler Chair in Parapsychology at Edinburgh University in his will, um, that he said, well, either something very remarkable is happening, or there is an incredible conspiracy of fraud. And in fact, there was an incredible <laughs> conspiracy of fraud. <laughs> <laughs> so, psych psychic powers, uh, as far as I'm concerned, right out the window. But yeah, you were saying <laughs> that, was, that was the first one. I read lots of Heinlein juveniles, Isaac Asimov, and then being one of these nerdy kids, and most of my friends at school were other nerdy lads, we worked our way systematically around the first the junior library, then the grown ups library, from A to Z, from Aldous to Zelazny, and everyone in between. I don't think I, I didn't voluntarily read 
fiction other than science fiction between the ages of 12 and 22, <laughs> which is abysmal. And I got as far as first year English at Glasgow University. Um, I, I winged it by writing writing essays on the day of the triplets in 1984. And I even got a distinction. So there you go. You can get a long way with science fiction, but you can't, can't get, get all the way with it. You do have to read real, real, uh, real literary fiction sometimes. And when I discovered real, you know, literary fiction, um, there was then about ten years in which I didn't read any science fiction at all, except Ian's manuscripts, obviously. Yeah. So I have a question. It's twofold. Like, how would you say your writing has changed since you began in 1987 and now? And how would you also say that science fiction has changed since the late 80s? And what science fiction is now? Oh, thank you. These are good questions. I think, in terms of my own writing, one of the things that has changed is that I've become rather less pretentious and wordy. I, one, one of the big influences on me and uh, also, also on, on Ian, if I can recapitulate a little on, on that, I met Ian Banks at high school and we both loved science fiction, we both read it a lot and we had quite a bit in common. And in high school, in our first couple of years at university, and we one of the big influences on us was a magazine which had become a quarterly and then a, a very irregular mm -hmm. paperback anthology called New Worlds. And New Worlds contained very interesting experiment, rather experimental stories that weren't much like traditional science fiction and some scathing criticism of traditional science fiction by critics like John Clute and Mike Harrison. And I had the, I suppose every writer, just as every artist starts by copying, every writer starts by sort of, you almost unconsciously imitate a style, sometimes you consciously emulate a style. And my idea of the perfect science fiction style was my Harrison. Mm -hmm. So I did this quite uh, over, overloaded writing. And in my first novel in particular, then my, then my second novel, when I was writing the, the first few chapters of my second novel, I made a, a great discovery, which I, I recommend to any aspiring writer. And that is, I showed it to the guy who was at that time, or had just recently been the writer in residence here at Edinburgh University, Andrew Gregg who lived in the same town as I did in South Queensford. And we became friends. And um, Andrew had a look over a few pages of the second chapter of my second novel, and he went through it with a sharp pencil, and he said, it's like taking the fluff off the needle. For the younger people there, it's a reference to the needle on a, a vinyl. It improves the sound when you take the fluff off. And similarly, it improves the clarity of a sentence no end if you cut out all redundant words from it. And since then, it's something that has to be done for you by somebody else, I think, showing you where your writing is going wrong on a sentence by sentence basis, showing you how to line edit. Get someone to show you how to line edit, and then you can do it for yourself forever after. And you can then show it to other people and pay it forward, which is what I've done several times as a, as a creative writing mentor of one kind or another. The, so yes, I think I've cleaned up my style a bit. The, what's changed in science fiction is that in the 1980s there was a A sense in science fiction that it wasn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. In the nine, roughly speaking, the the ages the ages of science fiction um, are the early the years where it wasn't consciously science fiction like um, Vernon and Wells and so on, and then this um, American 
editor from Luxembourg, Hugo Gernsback, put out a request for more of that Jules Verne, H.G. Wells stuff, which he called science fiction, and eventually science fiction, and turned it into a, a self-aware genre. And then there were some in the nineteen in the nineteen thirties and forties. There were some notable editors, and one of the most influential was John W. Campbell, who did, made a huge job of um, developing new writers, people whose names became household names, like Heinlein and Asimov and Ray Bradbury and others, and who the SF from that period is what what is is it's the kind of SF that goes into movies and television now. And what's what a lot of people who don't read out SF think all of SF is about. All the cliches of ray guns and spaceships and robots and all the shiny stuff. Um, in the 50s, there was a more, if you like, humanistic form of SF, where you had the social sciences being brought in. There was anthropology, there was sociology, there was even... Um, there was feminist influences, which there have been, in fact, in SF all along, although be it very contested at the beginning. And in the 1960s, in a way, you could say that the decadent future societies of science fiction had already arrived with drugs and space travel. And space travel was real and it turned out to be much less of a, an individual enterprise than SF had imagined, and much more slow and cumbersome. <coughs> and these brought about the new wave and the new wave was the 60s cultural revolution in the west in going into science fiction and that had crashed out in the, towards the end of the 70s and there was well, lots of other development there wasn't any great movement there were a lot of very good work um, was going on but there wasn't a, there was no sense of a, a cohesive movement in science fiction until cyberpunk came along. And cyberpunk was once again SF catching up with the present in the, the beginnings of video games, computer networks, and all of that, which were just beginning to get into everyday life. Um, my, my, various forms of um, microbiology, um, molecular biology, all the possibilities of that suddenly got thrown into science fiction by people like Sterling, Bruce Sterling, William Gibson, Pat Carrigan, and Ian Kay. Um, after that, there was a, I suppose my early novels were once described as post-cyberpunk, in that they, their heroes and heroines were people who had jobs, who weren't marginal characters. Um, <coughs> and after cyberpunk, there was something that I was part of, and that Ian may well have launched in his way, which was the new space opera, and that was going back to the big scale, colourful stuff, but in a hopefully more sophisticated way. After the new space opera, there was the new weird, or what some people called hard fantasy. Um, by analogy with hard SF, hard SF being SF that's scientifically rigorous, hard fantasy is fantasy that's magically rigorous. <laughs> <laughs> um, and New Weird was one of those movements that really went up like a rocket and down like a broomstick. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, it was applied to such novels. Well, the, the paradigm case of that novel was China Mabel's wonderful Perdigo Street Station and some of his subsequent work. Some of um, Mike Harrison's work as well became regarded as new weird. Steph Swainston wrote um, the Castle trilogy, which again is, is um, rigorously imagined fantasy. And there have been some more things along that line. So in a, in a sense, the most, the biggest developments in science have been kind of outside of science fiction. 
The last stirring of a movement in science fiction was called mundane, or what we, in other European languages, as more excitingly called profane. <laughs> <laughs> mundane SF was SF that said, set out as a rule, set of, a set of rules which was no fantasy stuff, like no faster than light, no conscious godlike AIs, no immortality, probably no travel outside the solar system. That's your framework. Now make the most of it. What can you do with it? And some of us said, well, we've been writing this all along. <laughs> And, but it was an interesting set of constraints to work within, although I don't think I ever consciously worked within that. I may have accidentally perpetrated the mundane SF at one point or another. <laughs> and at the moment, the field, I, to put it positively, I would say the field is wide open to any, any new experimenters who want to take it in new directions. I guess to sort of dovetail on that, um, actually my husband and I are having a debate last week about science fiction and uh, gender roles in science fiction and in other spheres of life as well. And um, he was sort of commenting, sort of arguing that um, women are just underrepresented in science fiction. Um, and even when there are female writers like Margaret Atwood, it's described as speculative fiction. Um, and do you think there's any going to be any change in that, or do you think women actually are underrepresented? And do you think it's a a man's genre? Um, well, I would hope it's not a man's genre, and I I try to make sure it's not. I think the truthful answer is that too often it is. The In Britain in particular, there's a really dire set of self-reinforcing, you know, um, processes that's quite hard to break out of, and that is that publishers think that SF by women won't sell, so fewer women will write SF. Several very talented women writers of SF from Britain are writing in America and are published in America. The several, you know, having a, women do tend to do better in uh, commercially in writing fantasy novels, but again, fantasy has got its own huge. Sexism problems, right? <laughs> With, um, there's been a, almost in reaction to that, I, I, I suspect there's been a a, ten, a new tendency in fantasy called grimdark, which is has as much to, which is kind of what it sounds like, you right? Extremely violent, mm -hmm. ostensibly realistic fantasy set in battle, you know, medieval kingdoms and so on, full of, full of well, rape. Village and so on, all uh, described fairly, fairly up close. This is not, uh, I don't think, a, a particularly healthy development. But you know, women have been underrepresented in science fiction, but there's an increasing number of women who do write science fiction, and in terms of the readers of science fiction. That's where the really galling thing about it is, because most readers of science fiction are women. Mm -hmm. Just as most readers of anything are women, of any kind of fiction. So, uh, um, <laughs> why... There, there has, to be, has to be a way out of these terrible cycles. <coughs> and... There is some the other the other issue that comes up that has come up um, in the last few years is 
race and if you like geopolitical equality or now called post-colonial mm-hmm. post-colonialism um, which was there was a, there were various social media wars went on in, in science fiction readers and, and science fiction fandom which um, some of which was more heat than light and very painful for many people concerned. But um, science fiction from the, what was formerly called the Third World and from outside the outside Europe and North America is in an increasing presence mm-hmm. and um, quite a lot of people are doing a bit to make it more felt. If you look up, there's an, an online SF magazine called Strange Horizons, which has had several, all I think it's at least one all women issue, at least one all outside the UK, outside um, you know the Anglosphere issue. Jeff Ryman has got a recent piece in that called 100 Right African Writers of SF. So I think that's progress because, uh, however belated it is, and Chinese writers are becoming increasingly um, prominent. And SF is being translated in China and out, into Chinese and out of Chinese all the time. Mm-hmm. So there's there's pr- progress that's going on. You know, the field is um, well. I think the field reflects the society in which it's produced, and it's it's all the more it's inadequacies are all the more infuriating because they're projected into the future. So um, you can have uh, far too many science fiction novels give the impression of an all-white or all-European people. Certainly ludicrous, often ludicrously male-dominated future, just by default, you know. So, I think the, the one thing I struck about the restoration game was the was the kind of the analysis of the, uh, the development of uh, kind of computer kind of developments and communications and software and games and how that kind of was tied into geopolitical movements, revolutions, and changes, and you, well, one can't in this current age not be sensitive to to the kind of the role of social media in shaping kind of democratic will or, or taking people in one direction or another. Is that, do you kind of reflect on that as you, as you kind of sit through the current era, uh, or do you kind of look back on your books and think, hmm, <laughs> that's, that, that's kind of that's where we are, or that's where we're becoming in some sense? That's a good question. The one, one of my novels that tried to you know, look at social media and, and geopolitics is, is uh, the execution channel. And when I wrote the execution channel, which was, I think, nearly 10 years ago now, or over 10 years ago now, and it's set roughly about now, and it's in a completely different world. Um, the, the main ways, the main kind of social media that I was familiar with, and that I thought would remain influential, was blogs. And blogs are still influential, but I didn't envisage anything like Twitter. <laughs> I just did not see that coming. <laughs> you know, if science fiction writers could produce, could predict the future, they'd be rich. You know, <laughs> they'd, they'd invest in, in the next big thing. And by and large, we don't. Uh, but only the, the general, um, one of the things that that novel did get right was that was the kind of false flags social media. In other words, you have and effectively what are now called trolls, um, people who are 
pretending to stand for a partic some particular viewpoint or party or whatever, and who in fact are agents of their opponents. That this, this kind of what's called black propaganda and grey propaganda is a very old technique of propaganda, but now with social media and um, online online stuff, it's uh, well, it, it's considerably easier to do, and in many ways, it's it's more it's harder to spot because presumably when the Germans were dropping leaflets over the Allies and vice versa, it was quite easy to tell um, who was faking whose propaganda, but when, you, when it's all, all electronic, it's a lot harder to trace. You, you, you don't know who you're interacting with online. And this is a, this is a, a disturbing thing, and I think it's going to get, only going to get more disturbing as we go on. I don't think it's been fully reflected in science fiction. I'm, I'm trying to think of ways to, to do that myself, but uh, so far it's one of those plates that are spinning in the air. You know? You'll have to be quick before the reality becomes... Yes, <laughs> well, yes, yeah. Um, the, I suppose, you know, in, in, the, in the Restoration game you have the the maple revolution, which was, we had all the color revolutions of the time and the early, and in round about that period, 2005, 2006. Um, I guess I have another one. So you mentioned that your father was a minister. And this book, I think, kind of deals with a little bit. It, it kind of gets into like what is the meaning of our purpose here, who's kind of in charge. And I'm just wondering if that background in religion has played any role in your writing career. Well, funnily enough, not really. I, I like I said, I, one of my novels is specifically about religion as a social phenomenon. Um, that's the night sessions, which imagines a, a kind of state-enforced secularism where the, the police have to have what they call non-recognition. Non it's like the French version of secularism, but even more um, severe, in that you just don't, you don't, uh, you don't, there's no persecution, it's just that you don't recognize that any religious institution or motivation whatsoever. And so, you know, people, somebody's shooting bishops and stuff like that, so they start, have to start doing it, looking into it. Um, the, and I, for that, you know, I drew on a lot of the stuff I had grown up with about the, the Presbyterian um, tradition in Scotland, in the Martyrs. Just a few hundred yards from here, there's the Breakfires churchyard with the Covenanter Memorial. And, Find out you can. We had our, all our. We had our, our our martyrs. The whole, in fact, a lot of this part, this, the central bell, between Ayr, Ayrshire, Ayrshire and the central bell, the moorlands are dotted with martyrs, memorials, and graves. So there's a long tradition of religious violence in Scotland, um, which is not, which of course has been assimilated into respectability, as it as it does. And I, I was, I did want to think about that. And I've written a couple of short stories um, which de deal explicitly with religion. Um, one has the perhaps unnecessarily provocative title, Jesus Christ Reanimator, which tries to imagine a, a second coming, a, you know, a return out of the sky on the battlefield of Megiddo, or the archaeological site of Megiddo, um, in present-day Israel stroke Palestine, how, how what it was. And the another one is called A Case of Consilience, which is a riff on a classic SF novel about religion, A Case of Conscience, by James Blish. Um, 
that's a very, a very finely uh, thought through SF novel recently reprinted with an introduction by me uh, in Golan's SF Masterworks. And A Case of Conscience has got um, a Jesuit uh, astrobiologist on an alien planet who comes to believe that the planet he's on cannot possibly be part of God's creation for reasons that make tremendous theological sense. But, it, you know, that's a very difficult position to have for him to have, so he has to take it all the way to the top. Um, so yeah, my case of consilience was again about a missionary on an alien planet. But apart from that, I haven't really gone into it. In, in terms of the, you know, the, the simulation possibility, that's that's something I don't well, I don't take seriously in any existential way. But it's tremendous. It can be tremendous fun to play around with. And it's, a, it's an interesting thought experiment as well. I suppose there's a kind of deterministic sense, isn't there, with characters that have been found by someone yeah. else. <laughs> yeah. so, so that this is yeah. kind, of a, kind of a, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm not who I think I am. <laughs> mm -hmm. In that space, so I suppose in a sense there's a theological kind of, mm -hmm. kind of subject there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Free will and, and, yes. and control. Yes. The world was a brilliant because my grandparents live in Durek and so my family was a brilliant as well. What's it like making a film like Brunick and putting it into an, an SF context with your help? Because that, I mean, that, the thinking of working class area of Scotland and an Alberta working class and the crucial need of art as part of the country. Um, like something like a bit like, I forget the, the author, but he did a lot of the good thing with the Scotland Journal, like he used a similar sort of contemporary landscape and a deprived landscape and exhibiting it through the lens of all of our early science fiction mm -hmm. or like oh, what was your place to tell instead or what was your place to tell and and you make it through the genre or through your own fiction as well. Yeah the only um case where I've used Greenock itself in in science fiction is in a novella called The Human Front. Um, where I kind of reproduced the and remixed, if you like, the culture shock that I had coming yeah, from yeah. Lewis to Greenock. And the Greenock I describe in that novella is not too far removed from how it felt. Um, I, I, as I've said in, on other occasions, I, I was quite shocked coming from Lewis to Greenock because. I had a, although life on, on the Isle of Lewis was in some ways quite, um, could be quite hard, but nobody was actually poor. Mm. Um, you, in large families, people got their older <laughs> kids, siblings, clothes and so on, yeah. handed down and that kind of thing, but nobody was Nobody was malnourished, whereas in Greenock, even in the mid 60s, one could see kids who, had, who were a bit malnourished, and you certainly could see older people who suffered from rickets, which was a big shock to me. <coughs> and now Greenock is, is post industrial, it's quite a, quite a depressed area. Um, and I I don't know how to deal with that aspect of things, whether you're that aspect of it in science fiction. I often, more often imagine the Highlands transformed in various ways by development of one kind or another. And it's harder to imagine you know, transformed. Although actually, come to think of it, I have done that in um, my novel Descent, yeah. uh, where there is a, a new bloom and things things improve.
improved. Uh, something I would quite like to see, although I very much doubt that it will happen in the uh, kind of behind the scenes way that is described in the descent, is to be much more a, a, a conscious upheaval. Does that? There are, there are several alternative futures, possible yeah. for Scotland, and I've tried to imagine some of them. The what I was about to say was that there is a, there is one quite well known and influential realist novel set in Greenland called A Green Tree in Getty, mm -hmm. which um, I remember, which I. I read and was very impressed with when back in my twenties, and that captures actually a much more, much more um, realistically what Greenland was like in the sixties. It really was like that. I mean, I, I know the streets and the buildings that yeah, he's yeah. talking about. Um, yes, and um, I. What Scotland's future might be, I, I have my own hopes for that. I don't, I don't think it's really worth going into them now. I don't. I think it's a. I'm a bit un, uncertain myself on the question, for example, of independence, because uh, I'm not particularly keen on it, but I can see it. I can see it as a possibility, um, and which might make which might make a difference. I have to apologise for my voice, but we've just sort of got over, or I'm just getting over a cold, so all this talking is a bit wearing me out a bit. I hope I'm not wearing out your ears. No, I think uh, I just think of the tremendous spaceport opportunities in front of yeah. us. Okay, a revitalisation for. For, for the West as they go. So Ken, thank you very much. Thank you very much.